Hi everyone, this is Bob Dietrich. Welcome to another edition of the ADHD Toolbox. And today we are honored to have the great Susan Lasky with us. And <laughs> Susan, welcome aboard. And I say the great Susan Lasky because you're one of the founders of, of CHAD. Uh, CHAD um, different, has different stations throughout the, the um, United States. You did New York. Uh, so how was that? I, it was incredible. This was in 1989, and people didn't even know what ADD was. I didn't, and that's why we, we co-founded, we started it when my son was diagnosed at three and a half, and the only information I could find was that it was either food-related, and on that I've come full circle. I don't think it necessarily causes ADD, but I certainly think it exacerbates symptoms. Right. Um, or it was PPP, which stands for this poor parenting, and I didn't accept that either. So we started uh, the New York City chapter of CHAD to bring in the few experts that there were at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was incredible. We would have over 100 people at our meetings. Um, they were so desperate for information, as we were. This was really pre-internet. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually an incredible experience. Uh, and it wasn't until a few years after uh, starting the Chad chapter that I found that I had ADK. <laughs> so I know I and that okay. was a revelation. Yeah, and that's a theme that we've we've heard here in the toolbox interviewing, you know, so many different experts is that many parents uh, don't find out they have ADHD until their children are diagnosed, and that seems like what that's what happened with you as well. Well, and not really, because what happened is I I didn't get um, I didn't really understand that I had ADD until. Uh, Dr. Thomas Brown did his work with high-functioning, non-hyperactive, high-achieving women because no one would have thought it possible that I had ADD. But like my first reaction, uh, I was at a conference and he introduced his Brown Attention Deficit Disorder Scale, the BAD scales, and it was geared towards executive function, mm -hmm. which is what I'm talking about today. And when I scored something like 42 out of 44, I said, oh my God, my life makes sense. Because how can I be so good at some things and so dense at others and, and struggle so mightily to get things done, even though I will get them done eventually. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so that was a revelation and I think he did um, he opened up a whole new area of ADD diagnostics. That's fantastic. Well, um, for those who don't know, CHAD is one of the biggest, uh, if not the biggest organization for ADD and ADHD in the world. That's C-H-A-D-D.org. Uh, so you can check them out there if you're interested. Um, but today we're going to be talking about some, uh, some awesome stuff here. You know, we call it the ADHD toolbox and it's because we want to give you tools. And this presentation today is focused on nothing but tools. This is like awesome stuff for, for tools that you can use uh, to help you deal with the challenges that come with ADHD. If you have them yourself, if you have them with your kids, you're gonna love this conversation. So let me introduce uh, Susan uh, for a bit so you know who Susan is. She's a certified productivity and executive function ADHD coach, a business consultant, and professional organizer. Uh, she's been helping clients become more productive and successful for over 30 years, almost 30 years. So um, Susan's been an advocate for people with ADHD since she co-founded CHAD in, in uh, New York in 1989. And her focus is on the practical tools, compensatory strategies, and mindset shifts. And that's important because we're gonna talk about mindset today. The mindset uh, shifts uh, that enable clients to clarify and attain goals and get and stay motivated, overcome overwhelm and procrastination, become better organized, and effectively manage their time and priorities, papers, projects, relationships, communications, systems, space, and stuff. And you guys know what the stuff is because um, it's all around you. <laughs> uh, as a result, clients have less stress when they work with Susan, they gain more time, they gain more energy, they gain more focus and they get things done to grow their business and succeed in school or the workplace and they get the balance, their work and their home and their self-care, which is awesome. Um, they, they maximize their unique potential and they 
uh, and they close the frustrating gaps between potential performance and ability and outcome. So this is awesome stuff and you guys are really gonna um, uh, love this. And at the end, we're gonna give you two free gifts. Su Susan's gonna give you these gifts. And one of them is a seven step power plan to success, and, uh, uh, which is a guidebook and you're gonna get be able to download that, but you're also gonna be able to download the task appointment manager. So I'm gonna have Susan tell you what those are and then we're gonna jump right in. So Susan, what's the seven step power plan that, are, that they're gonna get um, at the end of this talk? The seven step power plan is a coaching or self coaching paradigm I developed. And it relates very much to what I'm talking about today because the first step is self-awareness, who you are, who you're not, or who someone else is and who they're not, what you're likely to do, what you're not likely to do. If you're going to make shifts, you have to start with reality. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes is very hard to recognize or evaluate, mm -hmm. but it's not, it, step number two is self-acceptance. We are who we are. And if we accept that, and feel good about it and and studies now show that self-acceptance is actually contributes to productivity it contributes to happiness it doesn't make you egotistic <laughs> right. it's just it's it's just you are who you are and i think it's important that when we're working with ourselves when we're working with children they feel accepted even though they have struggles Step number three is that you could still make a difference in how you are and how you work, but it has to be in keeping with who you are. So step number three is belief in possibility mm -hmm. and that you always have a choice in the matter. And sometimes people with ADD feel they don't have a choice. Yeah. They feel they're a victim of who they are. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to feel that way, yeah. um, but you do have a choice and the idea is to figure out what those choices are. Step number four is setting goals mm -hmm. and prioritizing them, something that requires executive function. So some people may need help to do that. Step number five is once you have the goals, how are you going to get them done? So step number five is developing the right strategies. And these strategies have to be strategies that work with the way you think, not the way you think you should think, not the way you tell someone else they should be. And sometimes it may seem counterproductive, but it actually is more efficient in the long run for the person because they have an atypical brain. Or even if you have a typical brain, you have to work with who you are. Step number six, which I left out when I first developed my seven steps, is taking action. Because as we know, think, 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 don't act. Um, it's very easy to have a plan, but not execute it. So step number six is taking action. And step number seven is evaluation. It's looking back saying what worked, what didn't, and then instead of throwing up your hands, tweaking it, making it more your own, becoming more capable of incorporating it into what you do and letting go of some of the frustration. It's almost like expect failure so that when failure happens, it doesn't throw you, but at the same time, expect success. That's, that's fantastic. So your seven step power plan to success uh, guidebook is uh, going to be available free to everybody viewing today. Um, and we'll tell you how to get that in a second. We'll also uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll tell you about the task appointment manager and what that's all about. Um, but let's jump in. Let's, let's uh, get uh, right to the interview because you've got a lot to share today and I want to make sure we get it all in. Um, so uh, I guess my first question is, uh, what do you see um, as a major issue when you have ADD, ADHD, executive function challenges? Well, the benefit of having an ADHD diagnosis mm -hmm. is that it changes moral judgments. You're lazy, you're careless, you're inconsiderate into symptoms related to a medical condition. Unfortunately, people with ADHD will often judge themselves as will others judge them based on thinking 
they could do something and it's their choice to do it or not do it. Yet uh, the reality is actually, if I could, I would. This is especially tough due to the inconsistency of ADD. People are at times more capable of accomplishing things than they are at other times. And it isn't because they don't care or don't try, although that's sometimes true for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, as Russell Barkley puts it so well, ADHD is not a disorder of not knowing what to do, but a disorder of doing what we know. Sometimes the person with an ADD or executive function challenge just doesn't get how to do things efficiently or effectively. And because they're bright and otherwise capable, their lack of understanding is questioned. So it's critical to understand the impact of executive function on performance and self-esteem. When you struggle with time management and the ability to prioritize, plan, get things done, or you have difficulty organizing yourself, your environment, or your thoughts, when you can't seem to activate even when motivated, mm -hmm. or you forget to do things you considered urgent only a short time before, Mm -hmm. It is so easy to become frustrated, anxious, angry, or depressed. And let's face it, the people around you get that way for you, right. with you. So it's especially true since a lot of things don't make sense. <clears throat> like, how could you be so intelligent and easily tackle difficult items, but it takes forever to do something simple, repetitive, or boring? How you can, can't stay focused long enough to complete the task, but you can hyper-focus on something that interests you for hours. Mm -hmm. Or how you can put in ridiculously long hours to finish a report or a homework assignment, and then you fail to hand it in. Got so. it. Got it. So, so, if, uh, so what you see as a major issue when you have executive function challenges is, is first that maybe we don't see ADHD for what it is, uh, but then you have these, these struggles that you're going through that are so um, challenging. And I guess uh, changing your approach is super important. So what do you mean by changing your approach? Well, as, as a coach, mm -hmm. I focus on what can be done given the fact that you have certain challenges that are going to get in the way, whether you like it or not. Right. This, I don't believe we can change. And I say we as an adult with ADD and EF challenges, but we can make shifts in behavior and mindset that result in changing certain actions and creating a strong likelihood of accomplishing our goals. An example of what I mean, I tend to be late. I was always late. <laughs> I've learned to be on time, usually, but I still consider myself a late person because without applying the strategies, I will be late. <laughs> so I didn't really change, but my ability to change the situation by using strategies changes. And I think that's important. It's an important distinction because you're not telling someone to stop being who they are. Instead, it's helping them to get in touch with that person and be realistic about strategies and problem solving. Mm -hmm. I spoke about step number one, self-awareness. That's what I mean by that. The more you know yourself, the easier it is to find solutions that are in harmony with your thinking instead of forcing the, quote, right way to do things. Mm -hmm. And these personalized strategies are more effective and they're much more sustainable. You know, if I can interject real quick, um, uh, it, it's interesting because, you know, putting this program together, you know, I'm thinking, do I, ch did I change myself or am I just the same? And I've just done what you, you just said about being late and stuff. And with putting this program together, um, I, I, I don't use calendars very well. I kind of remember things, right? And, and most of the time I get it, a lot of times I miss it and I'm in trouble. But if I tried to do that with putting this program together and doing these interviews, I would be in big trouble because there's just too many people to, to talk to and interview and stuff. So I really had to force myself to use the calendar and I'm reflecting as I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, you know, I don't think I really changed, but I did start using a calendar, which helped me through it. So I totally get what you're talking about. That's awesome. You, you were able to self-motivate to use a tool that you had found not as helpful or not as usable because 
of knowing it would help you to accomplish a specific goal that meant something to you. Got it. Got it. So, so is this what your um, what your seven step uh, um, approach to coaching is? Then you're, you're like you're, you're well, you're... It, it it is, but it's it's a way of thinking about things, as I said, just from from awareness to needing to have the strategies and break them down, take the actions. And that's what I'll talk about um, coming up. <laughs> yeah. Got so. It. Well, so tell us what you developed because you've developed a, an approach, a coaching approach around this, right? And so. Uh, yeah, um, I did. And I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. So I'd like to hear more about what you've developed to help people go through the uh, and, and do what we just said. You know, they're not changing, but they're changing the results because they're able to put these things in place. So you develop a, a coaching process. I'd like to hear about that around that. Well, what I really look for is what is getting in, what is getting in the way. Mm -hmm. And one of the most common things that gets in people's way and that is not really understood as clearly as it should be is the role of overwhelm. It's really important to understand that it is easy to feel overwhelmed and that overwhelm has greater impact when you have a compromised executive function system. Got it. When neurotypical people have a lot to do, they are logically more likely to get started on what needs to be done. For the person with EF challenges or ADHD, overwhelm creates stress and anxiety, which are perceived as a threat by the body's nervous system. The amygdala will always triumph over the rational frontal lobes, causing the dreaded fight, flight, or freeze response. And so much falls into that category. So a person with ADHD might get angry and lash out when they feel overwhelmed. And you just see them lashing out and don't understand it. Mm -hmm. That's the fight response. Or they may ignore the work that needs to be done and go in the other room to watch TV or go for a walk. And you say, don't you care? Well, they're, they're taking flight. They're in the midst of brain-based reaction. Or they may spend hours staring at a blank screen or working on one paragraph of a paper. That's freezing. Knowing this, it is critical to recognize overwhelm triggers and minimize them. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest triggers is confusing a project with a task. You can't do a project, you can only do a task. But we tend to think in terms of projects, even something as seemingly benign as cleaning the room. Logically, it requires a few steps and not a lot of time, yet many people, whether kids or adults, go into avoidance mode when they think of having to clean a room. It is a repetitive task and probably boring, but the EF trigger is that it actually involves a number of separate tasks that when lumped together, trigger overwhelm. Think about it. You have to pick up items that don't belong in the room, and that requires getting activated to even start. And activation is extremely difficult when you have confusion about what to do next or how to do it. You need to throw the items away or bring them to the kitchen or another room. And then you have to hope you don't get distracted by something else and never return to your original job. You have to decide what to do with stuff. Mm -hmm. And decision making is not always a strength for sure. Then you have to put it where it belongs, and that requires action and follow through. Plus, many people lack the ability to categorize items or group like with like. So to them, each item is a separate challenge. So you have a, a cluttered room. You could just imagine how each thing stands on its own. So. You also need to remember where things are supposed to go in order to maintain organization. Yet memory isn't a strength. That's why I'm a big advocate of labeling drawers, cabinets, and containers with their contents. Label is best friend. <laughs> <laughs> when, and don't rely on handwriting. <laughs> when you put things away, you need to remain undistracted by the other items. 
it's easy to see something and get caught up in it, even in the room that you're trying to organize or neaten up. You may need to dust or vacuum, make the bed, etc. And all of those are individual steps. Plus, you have to remember to do all those steps, which is a sequential challenge in itself and requires a degree of memory and um, linear processing that is not the strength of most people who have these challenges. Not. There's also the sense of futility that makes taking action more difficult. It'll all have to be done again, so why bother? <laughs> so cleaning can feel overwhelming, which will lead to avoidance. And the same thing applies to doing anything that requires multiple steps to accomplish, whether it's writing a report or doing taxes. So yeah, I you know it's funny. I think um, I think I fall into all those categories. I, I've gone through all of those sets of, and I think uh, everyone does to some extent. But what you're saying, I think, is people with ADHD go through it out more often. They go through it more often and more intensely because these steps are related to executive function skills but you don't think of it that way you don't even think that there are so many steps involved so the parent yells at the kid just go clean your room or even in in a classroom straighten up your desk right. or on the job get that done but it's not as simple because the process of figuring out what needs to be done isn't internal as much when you have executive function or ADHD challenges. All right, well, this is great information. Um, so, and I have, well, maybe one last question here. So Susan, what do you think can be done uh, to help make things easier? Like what are the tools that we can use to, to make things easier for people with ADHD and some of the problems that we talked about so far? Absolutely, and that is, that is what's critical recognizing the problem and that the problem is not generated by a moral issue mm -hmm. it's an executive function issue so therefore what are the strategies that could help the interventions mm -hmm. um and the the way to minimize overwhelm and boost the likelihood of getting things done is to begin with planning planning time saves doing time most people don't like to plan I find it helpful to have an action way of planning, which is to use a simple project management sheet. Mm -hmm. This makes it clear that something is actually a project and not just a task. Because remember, you can't do a project, you could only do a task. And the idea is to break it down enough so that it becomes doable and not this big thing that's to be avoided. Mm -hmm. First, Make sure you or your child, employee or student, has a clear understanding of what the project entails, mm -hmm. both in terms of expected results and also what not to worry about. For example, I use, uh, spoke about cleaning your room. Mm -hmm. Cleaning your room doesn't have to mean organizing your dresser or your closet. Those are projects in themselves to plan and schedule separately. Write the project goal at the top of your project sheet. Next, clarify the benefits of doing this project from the perspective of the person doing it, not yours. Got it. The benefit of accomplishing a project to a parent, a teacher, or a boss may be different than what a child, a student, or an employee sees. And yes, sometimes the benefit is mostly to avoid consequences. But go beyond that to a reminder of what the benefit of avoiding the consequences would be. Mm -hmm. Basically, we're looking for a what's in it for me response. This helps move the project from a have to to a want to, which makes it easier for the brain to cooperate. If you aren't the person doing the project, you can offer suggestions as to the benefits but it is critical the doer finds them meaningful, which may not be for the same reasons as yours. Mm -hmm. A suggestion is that the next time the room is neat and organized, or the report is written, or the taxes are done, pause to consider how it feels and verbalize the benefits of having experienced success. 
This makes it easier to visualize the neat room next time or the completed report or the taxes finished. Mm -hmm. And so it increases the desirability of completing the project. It can provide keywords to use for future encouragement. By the way, do not do this exercise when the room is still messy. <laughs> While the messy room may drive you insane, the person with ADHD may have developed a degree of clutter blindness mm -hmm. or even comfort in their nest. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really bother them. Also, they may fear putting things away as out of sight is out of mind. Mm -hmm. This is very real and contributes to the file by pile organizing. So when organizing, use methods that take this into account, not methods that make your desk look good. The next step after defining the project goal and benefit is to determine what resources are needed to complete the project. Having the right tools or information ready and convenient makes the process much smoother. Would it be better to have a separate laundry basket in the bedroom? Do you need folders to organize that report or tax info? Preparation helps because if you don't have it, you start and then you freeze up because you can't move to the next thing or you're confused what to do. So now, the next step here is to break the project down into written steps. Mm -hmm. Normally when people talk about doing a project, that's what they start with. But I don't think it's what should be started with because then you're missing the whole aspect of engagement and how to make it easier. Mm -hmm. Don't rely on memory for anything, especially since it may fade away as time passes and memory is always, always, even if unintentionally, selective. Not surprising as short-term memory is considered an executive function. Consider posting the steps. This is definitely helpful with sequential steps. For younger children, use graphics showing the steps. Conversations disappear and reminders are really important. Make it interesting. The words used to describe each step should resonate with the person doing the job. Again, confusion breeds overwhelm. So let them describe the steps. You can make suggestions for others or be creative for yourself. So an example would be instead of saying dust the furniture, which like you turn a blind eye to that, it may be more entertaining and therefore more likely to be done to say capture the dust mites. Have fun with it. People with ADHD do not respond to the same motivation at the same level as people with neurotypical brains. So one way to get their attention is to make things entertaining. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Remember what is obvious to you may be oblivious to the person with ADHD. Saying something needs to be done without saying when is a recipe for avoidance. So the next step is to decide on an appropriate time to work on the project step by step. The idea is to think of doing only one task at a time, not everything needed to get the project done, which leads to overwhelm. I call this time a task appointment, which is an appointment with yourself to do a specific thing at a specific time. If you have a calendar or a planner, block out the time for that task appointment. Make it official. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the giveaways, uh, an explanation of the task appointment. Set, it helps to set a visual timer with the start time and the end time. I love the countdown timers that show, like the time timer that show the passage of time. Mm -hmm. Knowing you won't have to work on it for what may seem like forever, especially if it's something you'd rather not do, makes it easier to start. And anything you don't want to do or seems like it'll take a really long time to accomplish is again, going to be something you'll avoid. Setting a stop time also prevents taking too much time that other things aren't skipped, which creates additional problems. It, it helps minimize the um, 
the downside of hyperfocus, <laughs> where you get so caught up in things and nitpicking, and some people even refer to they get into almost an um, what they would call an OCD type thing where they, they nitpick totally. It has to be perfect. Right. Setting a stop time helps avoid that, especially if they could see the time is disappearing. It may be that task or project doesn't get finished in the assigned time frame, so just schedule another task appointment. This approach promotes success. You may not finish the project, but you will make progress. Because you seriously work for a set amount of time, you can have an immediate reward. And it's a good idea to create in advance a list of desirable and time-limited rewards. Because the time to think of these things isn't on calls, like add to it over a period of time, but devote some energy to figuring out what feels good. Uh, a reward might be time to play with the dog or a video game, watch TV, draw, play with Legos, go for a walk. It has to be something that is meaningful to the person. And you'll notice I left out food. <laughs> it's a reward. Right. Yes, right. Great. Thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> Most important is that by giving clarity to the project mm -hmm. in terms of what it is and how it will be accomplished, Mm -hmm. along with the priority of knowing when and the stress release of having a reward after working on a set task for a set amount of time. You're minimizing the stress and the potential overwhelm. So activation, sustained attention and completion are much more likely. Wow. It's a different approach for a different result. And so it sounds like this is your coaching method. This is one of the things that you coach uh, parents and teens and children and adults that have ADHD. You coach them through this process that we just talked about, right? Well, the project management is one strategy to use or a tool that could be used. And there are many others. And at the beginning, I spoke about mindset. Mm -hmm. If you're already convinced how inept you are, it's very hard to shift to being a person who could get things done. Um, on, on my website, I have a number of blogs that go into detail about some of these specific issues. Like there's one called the two magic words for productivity. And there it goes into a description of clarity and priority. Yeah. So yeah. you're definitely going to want to go to Susan's website at susanlasky.com and find uh, her blog and she'll have tons of information and suggestions and tips and tools on uh, what you can do to help yourself or your child um, or your spouse or whoever in your life that has ADHD um, help them with these uh these organization tools really and ways to help them with their executive function and productivity and and uh, that can be used really for anyone but it's especially helpful for uh, people with ADHD and you know one of the things um, that I've always done uh, well I've, I've started doing I should say is uh, understanding neurochemicals and how uh, dopamine can uh, release can help you get more motivated and, and it kind of um, you build mo momentum when when small tasks are done first and then you get excited for the bigger tasks you kind of work up to it because the dopamine is being released in your body every time you complete a task so um, i like to start with the small tasks and get two or three of them done then i feel like i'm, I'm on a roll and i roll right into the bigger tasks and that's yeah. that's something that i i use personally that that helps me using you know what i know about neurochemicals absolutely it's success breeds success so anything you could do that you feel a, a sense of accomplishment mm -hmm. will make you think that if it's possible to do bigger things. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, make sure that you uh, click below and uh, that will take you to Susan's website where you can uh, sign up and get the seven step power plan to success, which we described at the beginning of this program. And when you click below, you're also going to get a second gift, which is the task uh, appointment. And tell us a little bit about what the, um, the info sheet is on the task appointment. What is that? Well, I mentioned the task appointment briefly, which is an appointment with yourself 
to do a specific thing at a specific time. Mm -hmm. But the info sheet goes into a lot more detail of how to do it, the benefits, and um, how to make it work for you. Got it. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, as I'm listening to you earlier um, talk about these, um, these your, your, your process, I'm thinking, geez, uh, are parents going to write down all this stuff and go through this process? But it sounds like, you know, when you do it once and you start to make it a habit, uh, it really starts to change things. And, and do you want to fight with your kids or do you want to do something that has been proven to work? Susan's done this in, in the households for years, over 30 years now, and it works when you do it. So yes, it's definitely worth it. If you want a quieter household, if you want a more productive kid, uh, spend a little time to write it down instead of arguing with your kid and, and you'll see them create results, right? There's something else involved too, mm -hmm. which is when things are said, they could be questioned, misinterpreted, argued with. When they're written down and there's an agreement that comes when they're written down, you know, anything I left out, what do you huh? think? Should we switch this? Then it's like you could dismiss yourself from the process because it's it's there. You can't argue with it. You agree to put it in black and white. Got it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for all this information. This is um, a wealth of knowledge uh, for us. And of course, we have your website, which is going to, you know, um, exponentially give us the information that you just gave us. And uh, if you want to make sure you download the um, or click on the link below and get the free gifts that Susan's giving you. And if you have questions for Susan, you want to contact her, just go to SusanLasky.com. Um, you have a contact button there or you can email her at Susan at SusanLasky.com and there's a link below for that as well. So you have, um, have Susan at your fingertips and uh, you can get all that information uh, and the benefit of her years of experience. So you can work, uh, work on creating a happier, peaceful household. So thank you so much, Susan, for being here. I really appreciate it. You were fantastic and the information is so valuable. Really appreciate it. And, thank you uh, so you're, much. Yeah. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. And thank you for the work you do. And thank you all for watching this episode of the ADHD Toolbox. We'll see you on the next episode.